Good morning. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. And welcome again to our mask ultrasound Zoom meeting. And we are so privileged to have again Dr. Joe Parida. He is uh, our pioneer in regenerative medicine, and uh, he's based right now in Boca Raton, Florida. He is the chartered president and founder of the American Academy and Board of Regenerative Medicine. So for those of you who are interested to be certified in the regenerative medicine, it's very nice that uh, we can get in touch with Dr. Joe as uh, he's uh, one of the uh, members of the board for that. And uh, he surely will help you uh, do some things that will uh, make you a professional for regenerative medicine. And uh, it's my privilege to introduce him to you as he, he is the one who have been teaching us, teaching me also since uh, for the last maybe eight years, eight to nine years, Dr. Joe. And we are so happy that uh, we can welcome him again today. But before we begin, let's just pause for a moment and just uh, have a short prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for good health and strength. We thank you for Dr. Joe who's going to share with us his expertise on the topic of ozone and other essentials in regenerative medicine. Can it be with him and uh, can they give him wisdom and understanding from above. Teach us, all oh God, to trust in you and be humble in all our knowledge and skills. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So welcome again, Dr. Joe Purida. So go ahead, well, Dr. Thank you Joe. So much, Jim. I appreciate your introduction and it's an honor for me to talk to you guys. So good morning to all of you. It's uh, evening here and we'll get started because there's a lot of material and uh, I can make these slides available to Jim if uh, need be at the end of the talk. Uh, so don't worry about running in, taking all kinds of notes. So what I really want to talk about today is kind of what we call oxidative health systems. You know, ozone basically is really what controls oxidative health. And um, when we talk about oxidative health, we're talking about medical ozone therapy, we're talking about photomodulation and different supplements that can really help us in our battle against oxidative stress. It'll help promote longevity and a healthy life. And, you know, oxidative stress is what can many times lead to failure in a regenerative medicine procedure, be it PRP, be it uh, stem cells from fat, bone marrow, or a combination of these things. So basically what we want to talk about is, again, we're going to talk about something called EBO2, which is extracorporeal blood oxygenation and ozone therapy. And we're going to talk in great detail about that. We're going to talk about photomodulation. Uh, some of you may be familiar with that. I, uh, Jim and uh, Jojo have been seeing that for many years when I have my PRP, bone marrow, fat, et cetera. We'll put it in, a, in what we call an Addy light. We have these lights available now. Uh, we also have various supplements that are both photosensitive and antioxidant. And then we have other therapies such as V-cells and things like that. Now, the goal of ozone therapy is to reduce inflammation, okay? This is a term that was actually brought up, I believe, Life Magazine a few years ago. And as we age, inflammation goes up, up, and up. And, and that's really one of the signs of aging, increased inflammation. And again, inflammation can make or break success in your procedures. Now, ozone is a very good method in achieving the goal of reducing inflammation or inflammation. Again, aging, inflammation, they go hand in hand. So if we look at this balance board here, we can see the little stick figure here. He's on the balance and we have on one side, we have antioxidants and the other side, oxidative stress, which keeps rising as we age. Age-related diseases increase oxidative stress, inflammation, etc. So basically, uh, what we're doing is we are uh, with health and everything. Uh, we have antioxidants. We have different types of antioxidants and things like that. So let's move on. So let's look and see what happens. At birth, you know, we don't have to worry too much about oxidative stress. But as we age, it becomes very important. And you can see some of the things that happen. Lipid and protein damage cytoskeleton damage, accumulation of aberrant proteins, organelle dysfunction, especially your mitochondria. That's really where the damage goes in the mitochondria, the powerhouse of the cells. When your mitochondria are not working well, guess what? You're, you're finished. You're, you're, you're out of the picture, so to speak, because you're not going to survive. 
And you know, other things about uh, the uh, oxidative stress, cancer, osteoporosis, dementia, neurodegenerative diseases, and it goes on and on and on. So basically how is ozone made? Well, sometimes I know in the Philippines, there's a lot of thunderstorms like there is here in Florida, and you'll go out after a thunderstorm sometimes and you'll smell that, that pungent odor. And what's happened there is the electricity from the lightning has bonded oxygen together and it's made a triple oxygen. So you start here with regular uh, dipole oxygen and it becomes triple oxygen. And that's what ozone is. And then lo and behold, ozone basically has that very active molecule that it gives up. And that's how we make ozone. So we can see it here where we have the duplicate, duplicate oxygen and then it becomes triple oxygen and then it goes ahead and it gives a single atomic oxygen. And that's what does all the magic that ozone can do. So one thing you, me, you must realize, and this is something that's important for a lot of aspects of medicine. Ozone is what we call a pro-drug, meaning that it's a drug that's inactive before it's metabolized in the body. Now there's certain drugs you'll take, certain pharmaceutical agents, they're active right away. You take them and they're active. Whereas other pharmacologic agents have to be activated by the body. And ozone is one of those um, entities, okay? So basically, we know a couple of things about ozone. It's 10 times more hydrosoluble than oxygen is, especially in let's say the uh, aqueous environment of the plasma. And there's a therapeutic window when you use ozone. Basically, you want to have these concentrations between 80, 10 and 80 uh, micrograms per milliliter, okay? Now, again, ozone acts as a pro-drug. Pro now, what it really does is it makes two messengers, and I'm going to get into this in, in just a bit, in a few minutes in detail. It makes hydrogen peroxide, believe it or not, and it can make something called a lipid oxidation product. So that's another aspect of it. Now, like any drug, Ozone is dose dependent. What do I mean by that? Well, I'm gonna give you a good example. Think of glucose. If your glucose level is too high, that's obviously a big problem. You have that in diabetics where they could get a diabetic coma from too high of glucose. Or if it's too low, hypoglycemic, same thing, a hypoglycemic coma, okay? Same thing with oxygen. You know, we're used to oxygen at 21% concentration. We can survive with that for many, many years. But if you breathe pure oxygen, it's deadly after just a few days. So like anything else, ozone specific concentration that can do its magic. Too high, it's obviously gonna be detrimental. Too low, it's not. Now, one thing I have to tell you about ozone when you're using it, we'll use it from medical oxygen. And the higher the concentration of oxygen, the lower the ozone amount is. So it's kind of inverse. So when you want to have a, a high amount of ozone, you put that uh, regulator down to a much lower level of oxygen. Okay. So here we see some of the, um, the things that ozone stimulates in a cell. Uh, high doses can go in there into the cell and it basically does a lot of what we call gene transcription. It's almost like a transcription agent. So what is a transcription agent? It affects the DNA in the cell. It turns on certain genes. That's what a transcription agent does. It can also turn off certain genes. Uh, it's really good for viruses. There's been a lot of uh, work with ozone and dealing with the COVID-19 virus. Uh, the Italians have had very good results using ozone to really kill the virus because what it does is it basically takes away the lipid envelope of the virus. It exposes its DNA and RNA and basically the virus just goes away. Now, there's what I call the pillars of medical ozone therapy. And what are these pillars? Well, we basically can, oxy we can optimize oxygen utilization. Um, we can stimulate something called the NRF2 and the NQ01 pathways. These may seem esoteric to you, but they're not. These are extremely important pathways in regenerative medicine. I can't stress to you how important it is. I'm just gonna write a, a blog that I'm gonna publish in the next couple of days on that. Uh, what else does ozone do? Well, we have the ozone messengers that I mentioned. Well, in this EBO2 technique, we actually remove debris from the blood. We have stem cell stimulation. And how does that work? Well, it stimulates metallic uh, proteins, matrix metalloproteases, basically, uh, in the bone marrow. And that can cause a significant release of stem cells from the bone marrow. And it also deals with cytokine release and immune stimulation. So now we start seeing, hey, wait a minute, there's a lot of things that ozone does that's very pertinent to regenerative medicine. So let's talk about basically ozone and how it affects ATP production. 
um, you know, what you must realize is that ozone can accelerate glycolysis. Now glycolysis, you break down glucose into pyruvate and you get very valuable hydrogen ions. These hydrogen ions are used to make ATP. So the bottom line is ozone can produce ATP. All cells need ATP. Now stem cells in particular, when you have a cell that's fairly quiescent, it can make um, its energy through glycolysis. But when a stem cell begins to differentiate, it has much higher demands of ATP, and therefore it has to switch over to oxidative phosphorylation. So that's why ATP is so important, because it can allow the stem cells to differentiate where they might not otherwise, okay? And we can see here, again, it's dealing with the Krebs cycle. We don't have to get into that great detail, but you have NADH uh, plus and you have NADH plus a hydrogen atom. And that's what helps produce the ATP. Now, one thing you have to realize, and, and I suggest you guys learn more about ND and ADH because this is really where the field of regenerative medicine is moving. NAD is extremely important and the ratio is very important. And that ratio should be about 700 to one. And guess what? Ozone medically in the blood will actually help uh, create that ratio, okay? Now, oxidative stress. Ozone does cause some oxidative stress. Now, oxidative stress in, uh, activates something called the NF-kappa beta pathway, okay? Now, this is basically a pathway of inflammation. This is how many cancers work. This is how many degenerative diseases, especially neurologic degenerative diseases work. And that's when you have severe oxidative stress. Luckily, ozone does not cause severe oxidative stress. It causes some moderate oxidative stress. You know, some oxidative stress is very necessary in the body. And what does this oxidative stress do? It st stimulates a pathway called the NRF2 pathway. And, and again, you see it written out there. And what this is, this is kind of like a thermostat of inflammation. If this pathway is stimulated, it helps reduce inflammation dramatically by secreting certain enzymes. These are called antioxidant response elements. That's a, a name you should probably know down the road. And these are basically things like uh, uh, SOD, uh, catalase, uh, glutathione, things like that. So basically the moderate oxidative stress that ozone therapy produces activates this pathway, the NRF2 pathway, extremely important because if NRF2 is, is working properly, you're gonna have a very healthy patient. If it's working improperly, you're gonna have a very sick patient, okay? Many cancers are because the NRF2 basically failed us, okay? And again, we can see here, moderate oxidative stress, so, I'm sorry, let me go back. We'll get uh, the NRF2 pathway right here. Now this pathway is, the NRF2 I should say, is found in the cytoplasm of the cell. And it's kind of locked in position. It's kind of like in a jail cell, but another enzyme called KEP1, and you can see that here, okay? Now, with the proper signaling, and NRF2 is basically like a signaling molecule, this KEP1 releases its bond to the NRF2, and what that NRF2 does is it enters the nucleus, okay? And when it enters the nucleus, it starts interacting with the DNA, and it starts certain, turning on certain genes. Again, it's a, like a transcription agent. And what do we get? We get basically a, many of the different antioxidant enzymes. Whereas if you have a severe oxidative stress, you get NF-kappa beta, and you get the opposite. You'll get uh, inducible nitric oxide synthase. That's great if you're gonna fight a, a viral infection or a bacterial infection, but it does cause collateral damage too. You know, that's one of the problems we're seeing with COVID-19. We're getting too much of a, of a inflammatory response and that's what's causing the death of many of these people, okay? So again, NRF2 is the master regulator of antioxidant detoxification and cell defense uh, gene expression. 600 genes are involved in that. Kappa beta is pretty much the opposite, okay? Now NQ01 pathway is basically a pathway that helps the NAD, NAD H ratio. Um, now here we are again, we can see kind of, and this is why I'm trying to stress this on a couple of different slides. So we have it here on this slide. Let me get my arrow if I can here. NRF2 resides in the cytoplasm. Remember, it's kind of held in jail by that KEP1. And then all of a sudden, a single goes, and lo and behold, we start getting oxidative stress reducing, inflammation is reducing. And NRF2 has a very profound effect on the mitochondria. 
anything that you're basically doing that has a beneficial effect on mitochondria is going to be extremely important in all your regenerative medicine procedures because success or failure typically is going to be because of what you do to the mitochondria. And this is basically a great slide. And again, I'm going to make these slides available to you guys. Only thing I ask of you, uh, you know, please don't make a whole talk on your own. I mean, try and learn from these. And if you want to use the occasional slide, that's fine with me. And this gives you an idea of some of the things that the NRF2 pathway does with the oxidative stress. And here, again, it helps with homeostasis. Again, mitochondrial membrane uh, and ATP synthesis, uh, mitochondrial fatty acid oxidation. Again, anything influencing the mitochondrial uh, uh, area in a positive way is extremely important, okay? Now, oxidative stress, it also stimulates something called the P53 gene, okay? P53 is basically called a tumor suppressor gene. And what that does is it literally helps prevent tumors in the body. Uh, most of our cancers, well, I shouldn't say most, but many of the cancers are when you have a mutation of this P53 gene. Now, interesting enough to tell you how the P53 gene works, um, elephants, one of the largest mammals known to man, have, you know, quadrillions of cells. But elephants almost never get a cancer. Why? Because they have multiple copies of the P53 gene. So that's something to keep in mind. And this is what the P53 does. It analyzes a cell and it says, you know, your DNA is damaged too much like we would see down in the bottom here. And lo and behold, it says, you're gonna stop the providing and I'm gonna make you go on to aptosis and die. Or it says, hey, you know, your DNA is damaged, but I think I can fix you. And it goes ahead and fixes that cell. The cell continues to divide and everybody's happy. So that's why P53 is important. Ozone will help stimulate the P53 gene, correct it if it's kind of malfunctioning, as will some phototherapy, okay? And again, we can see here the two pathways of ozone right there. You can either be anti-inflammatory or pro-inflammatory. Sometimes pro-inflammatory is important when you're dealing with a COVID-19, let's say, or a bacterial infection, but you don't want it to get out of hand. That's where we get into trouble. All right, so basically, how does it increase stem cell production? Well, again, the matrix metalloproteases, and particularly this one called matrix metalloprotease 9. This is found in the bone marrow. And basically what the ozone does, it helps basically break this bond. Think of this again as keeping the stem cells in jail. And all of a sudden the, the jail is open and the stem cells are free to leave the bone marrow as we can see here and they go into the circulation. So this will increase bone marrow stem cell release as will nitric oxide and other things like that. That's actually the basis of hyperbaric oxygen. Hyperbaric oxygen produces nitric oxide, which affects these bone marrow and these uh, metalloproteases, and they release stem cells to the circulation. That's why people, for instance, a diabetic who has a wound that won't heal, it's because he's now getting increased stem cells to go to the area. Remember, cells, not doctors, heal the patient. Okay, that's one of my pet little sayings. Again, just another picture that shows the same thing. All right, now, what are ozone messengers? This is what really makes ozone work. So ozone messengers are basically, this is the pro-drug. The body kind of helps metabolize these things. And one of the things that ozone makes in the circulation now, again, I'm not talking about breathing it in, but I'm talking about directly intravenous. Uh, we'll find that ozone can make hydrogen peroxide. And now the, the hydrogen peroxide does not last very long at all. It's very fleeting. It's a, almost like a singling molecule, but it can have a profound effect on the leukocytes, on erythrocytes, platelets, et cetera. It's a, an intracellular singling molecule. You know, there's a lot of singling molecules in the body. There's nitric oxide, there's carbon monoxide, and there's H2O2, very important singling uh, molecules. And we can see here, for instance, we have H2O2. It affects the erythrocytes, leukocytes, platelets, improved O2 delivery, immune activation, and other things. And then we have what we call the LOPs, lipid oxidation products. Now, though, unlike hydrogen peroxide, which is very short-lived, these things can live for weeks, and they will affect the bone marrow, releasing stem cells, the endothelial tissue, and other organs. So the effects of ozone can be right away, and it can be basically for weeks to, uh, after the treatment is done, okay? And basically they trigger the late effects and they upregulate up various anti-inflammatory enzymes, 
such as, like I say, SOD, glutathione, some of you are pro probably familiar with that, and they can do neuroimmune modulation. Um, parenchymal cells also can be affected by these lipid oxidation products. So it can affect the endocrine glands, the liver, the kidneys, bone marrow. So very, very interesting. It can go ahead and produce short-term and long-term effects. Also, and we're gonna get into this very shortly, it can induce something called heat shock proteins, okay? But again, here we are here. Ozone produces nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is extremely important. All of my patients in regenerative medicine are put on a nitric oxide donor. I feel the best one out there is something called Neo40. It's made by a company uh, called Human. Uh, this product was actually developed by the University of Texas. Then we have carbon monoxide. Remember now, dose deficient, or excuse me, dose dependent, I should say. Carbon monoxide, obviously, in higher doses is very deadly, but in a very small dose, it's a single molecule. And you can see some of the things that it does there. Again, same thing, it can affect platelets, it can affect the cells, et cetera. Now, heat shock proteins. You know, many years ago, we were saying, you know, it's interesting that people, when they go take a sauna, they seem to be healthier, or people that go into extreme cold seem to be healthier. What was the reason for that? Well, the reason for that is what it did is it helped the body produce something called heat shock proteins. Now, ozone can help produce these heat shock proteins, as can also ultraviolet light. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about these. So what heat shock proteins really do is they make the protein full. Now, remember, protein can be very long in its, uh, its character, so to speak, and it has to be folded into certain methods into the cell. Now, if it's folded properly, there's no problem. But if a protein is folded improperly, it leads to neurodegenerative diseases, cancer, diabetes, a whole host of bad things. So here you see in this little cartoon, we have the heat shock proteins. And what they do is they go ahead and resuscitate some of these proteins, repair them, and make sure that they're going ahead and folding properly. It's all about the folding of the protein and how it fits into the cell. And again, so the primary role of the heat shock proteins is it kind of is a chaperone. It keeps an eye on the protein and kind of follows it like a parent, making sure that it's going to do the right thing at the right time. Um, and when a cell is damaged, it, it basically can help generate uh, more proteins and help repair that cell. And again, you can see it right here in this little cartoon. The heat shock proteins are like parents. They basically can uh, go in there and make sure that the protein is going to fold properly. So that's the real key for ozone. Also, it makes the heat shock proteins because that's another probable area of failure when we don't have the proteins folding properly, okay? Now, what is basically the actual EBO2? Again, EBO2, extracorporeal blood oxygenation and ozone. So basically what we're doing is we're taking the entire circulatory system and running it through a dialysis filter we're filtering out various fats, cholesterol, heavy metals, and dead cells. And we're then hitting that, after that's been purified, we're hitting it with ozone gas, and it's then going back through a continuous loop into the patient. So it leaves one arm, essentially, through an IV, and it goes back the other arm. Now, in addition to what we're doing with the filtration, we're also hitting that blood with both an ultraviolet A light and a red light, and I'll get into that shortly. Now, there's another system that some people who have been familiar with um, ozone have been using in the past. It's called autohemotherapy. And this is where you would go ahead and take about 200 cc's of blood from the patient. You then put it in an IV bag with some heparin. Then you squirt ozone gas in there and you shake it up and you kind of mix the ozone gas with it. Then you pull it back out then you kind of inject it back into the vein. And you may do that 10 times. So you do about 2,000 cc's. But you're not doing any filtration of that or anything like that. Basically, you're giving him some ozone gas. But, you know, when you start doing that, you start shaking that blood up and everything, you're going to get a lot of hemolysis. So not, it's, it was the old technique. It was the, it was the only technique for many years. But now it's kind of like archaic as far as I'm concerned. Okay. So that's basically what I'm trying to show you here in this slide. Called a peristaltic pump. So basically, this is a line right here coming from the patient. And what this pump does, it actually pulls the blood 
from the vein. You want to just, you have to have some kind of force in this. So we're pulling that through the vein and then you're going to see it's going to go up into a filter. Let me go up to the next slide. Aha, uh -huh. now we can see our ozone, excuse me, our dialysis filter. This is a true dialysis filter. So the blood will enter through, it's going up, going up, going up, going up, going up. Then it hits with ozone gas here and then it goes this way and then it goes back to the patient eventually. Okay, so now you can see the same setup. Okay, so this is basically coming from the patient right here. It's going into the dialysis filter and it's traveling upwards in the dialysis filter. Okay, then hitting, getting hit with ozone gas after it's purified and going this way and then going back down. Now, notice the color. This is basically venous blood here. And if you look at this, it looks like arterial blood. So we've dramatically increased the oxygen content of that blood. Okay, in addition to some other things. So uh, what we're doing is removing uh, various waste products from the blood, inorganic substances, petroleum byproducts, fat microparticles. We'll see, actually see some globules of some plaque and fat and things like that. And basically uh, we're removing dead microbes, disease cells, detoxifying things. So it really is an important thing. Now, another thing that we end up taking out with our filtration system is something called beta-2 microglobulin. Okay, very sneaky little compound. And basically it's associated with many cancers and inflammatory diseases. And there's a relationship between that and the immune system. And pretty much the more you have of that, the more potential you have of developing problems. Now, um, it basically is a indicative of pro-inflammatory cytokines. It's associated with cardiovascular disease, diabetes, et cetera. And again, it seems to have some effect on the um, immune system with the T cells, lymphocytes, etc. Now, when we get this, uh, it goes in a separate container. And this is what we get from some patients. This is all foam from a patient. This has been, you know, over about maybe an hour or so that they have this. Um, and it's very interesting. And it, it basically is a marker of inflammation in certain diseases. And interesting, when we remove that, the next time we do an EBO2, sometimes on those patients, there's very little of it. So the serum concentrations are a risk for all disease, all death. So it's an important thing to take care of. And again, we have pro-inflammatory cytokines, IL-1, TNF, alpha, and uh, IL-6. And we can help remove some of those inflammatory cytokines in that beta-2 macroglobulin uh, canister. Uh, so you can see here, basically, again, it's getting a little technical here maybe more than we need to worry about, but it is an important thing because it has critical immune modulation functions. Uh, and, and, and I'll say that much about it. So also beta-2 macroglobulin is associated with advanced glycation end products. What do I mean by that? Well, you know, when you eat certain foods, fried foods and things like that, you'll get advanced glycation end products, which are kind of bad because they affect our immune system adversely. They uh, really make you gain adipose tissue, affect the GI system, the liver, the brain, pancreas. So a lot of bad things that are associated with it. And we, we're removing those. So basically, uh, it's an important thing to remove. And we're happy that we can do that. Now, here's another thing now. We have a safety chamber here. Because some people would say, well, you're using ozone gas and you're putting it into an intravenous line. Um, how are you going to make sure you don't get an embolism? Well, this is the safety chamber right here. You just keep an eye on this. As long as this chamber is filled with blood here, there's no chance of an embolism. We've not had any knock on wood, any problem whatsoever with that. Okay. Now, another thing we're using is photomodulation. You know, I, I basically had an epiphany one day. I said, you know, I have one big line of blood coming from the patient, another one going back to the patient. How about we actually use photomodulation on that blood so we can basically photomodulate the entire circulatory system. And that's what we've come up with. So we use a red light and we use a UVA light. Now, you know, what do we get with the red light? Well, mitochondria are very sensitive to light. When red light hits mitochondria, it helps produce ATP, nitric oxide, and things like that. So very important aspect of that. And basically, uh, we can see it aids in the production of ATP and nitric oxide release. Now, here's a red light that we're using. So this is a this is a line right here that's going back to the patient. So the blood would be flowing like this. And this is our red LED light. Now we have this chamber opened right now, but typically it would be closed. And these are all mirrors here. So you're basically bathing that entire blood supply with the LED uh, red light. 
And then ultraviolet A light is what we like because we think that can have some beneficial effects also. Uh, it can also help increase uh, certain circulating antibodies. It is a bit of a, stress, a stressor of the cell. It helps produce heat shock proteins. Again, the unfolding of proteins, very important. And you can see here, now this is interesting. If you were to look at this with your naked eye, it would not seem this deeply blue. But my iPhone camera takes a more true picture of it and you can see how blue it is. And this is what we're doing. This, this line typically comes from the patient first. Then it goes into the apparatus. And we can see here also that blue light can also increase the production of exosomes, which is a very interesting aspect of it. So the other, you know, we're getting towards to the end now. So can we use supplements to increase the efficiency? Absolutely. And these are some of the things that can help if increase it. This is terstilbin. Uh, you may have heard of resveratrol. This is a form of, sort of like a form of resveratrol that's much more bioavailable. You have true brock, which is basically a broccoli compound. Uh, very, very important. Turmeric, uh, called Ultra Cure, green tea, resveratrol. Fumaric acid, very interesting compound. Our F FDA in the United States, and this is over the counter fumaric acid, but the FDA just approved a compound, mainly fumaric acid, for the treatment of uh, MS. So keep that in mind. Quercetin, uh, some soy isoflavins, NAD, again, so important, and Neo40. And this is a, a supplement that I think works very well to reduce inflammation, NRF2. Probably something that you might want to consider giving to most of your stem cell patients. It's from a very reputable company in the United States called Thorn Research. It's a very good uh, product. So basically, uh, if we reduce NRF2, uh, or I should say increase it, we basically get mitochondrial metabolism better, we restore our redox balance, and we suppress cytokine production. Um, and are there any side effects with our, uh, our treatment? Well, once in a while, the patient kind of gets a feeling of chest, chest tightness, and that's because they're basically getting NED production. And what we do is we turn down the ozone for a bit, and that immediately goes away, and it usually doesn't come back then. And then we also sometimes use our cytokine patches. Sometimes after you, and this is very good, by the way, for autoimmune diseases and things like that, but sometimes the patient kind of feels washed out, so we use something called an AI patch, which is uh, basically a patch. Uh, we have it through our FDA here, and it's a patch that basically has interleukin-10 and interleukin-1 antagonists. We put it over the carotid arteries, and the symptoms pretty much disappear. Uh, what we're going to look at in the future is mainly using hydrogen gas and maybe xenon and maybe magnetic stimulation of the blood. And I think with that, we're going to go ahead and uh, take any questions you guys might have. I'm, I'm yours for the next, until tomorrow morning, my time. Any questions? Dr. Jokri, thank you very much. Yes. You're very, very much uh, ahead of your time. I remember thank uh, you. Dr. Joe, uh, eight years ago, was telling us about all these stem cells, bone marrow, PRP. And uh, I was watching the time it was introduced in the market, and it was only maybe four years from where he started talking about it that everything else was like uh, being used by a lot of uh, physicians so i can tell dr joe is very 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 much ahead of his time all the time and uh, this topic is just uh, mind-boggling in the sense that uh, this may not this may not be appealing to you at the, at the present time but i know this will be uh, in the in the near future as uh, was introduced to us with this uh, extracorporeal blood uh, oxygenation and ozone therapy. So, uh, Dr. Joe, thank you very much. But uh, I just have one question, though. Sure, Jim. Uh, how how often do you do this uh, to your patients, and uh, what are the criteria that you need to see before introducing this kind of uh, therapy well, to, to patients? It, it depends on the, what we're going to treat. Now, if we have somebody with an autoimmune disease, I may do it once a week for two or three weeks. Okay. Um, somebody may have a mold infection. We might consider doing that. And many, you know, I have a lot of professional wow. athletes that I take care of. Many, many of them do that for performance enhancement because it does, you know, get rid of a lot of the inflammation in the body. You know, some of my players who play American football, they really get banged up every week and week out. And they find that this is invaluable for them to increase their performance. And it's legal. That's the nice thing about it. I see. Uh, any any contraindication? Let's say you're you're 
a patient, a 60, 70 year old, would come to you and uh, would, uh, would want to have this therapy, uh, what would you ask him to uh, undergo first? I mean, do you need any, any medical clearance or some kind of a, maybe a to the echo or ECG clearance from cardiologist? As you had mentioned about the chest heaviness, chest pain immediately after the, the treatment. Interesting question. Now, when I say chest pain, it's the same as we see with NAD. It really has nothing to do with the cardiothoracic system. Okay, it has nothing to do with you know maybe you know making the arteries get smaller or something. It's just a phenomenon that we see. There's really very little, if any, contraindications other than someone who has a G6PD deficiency. Otherwise, I don't do any workup on the patient ahead of time. It's not necessary for a clearance because we're not really doing anything to stress the body. I mean, think about it. What we're doing is basically filtering their blood, which is going to help. We're putting more oxygen in their blood. So there's going to be really nothing that you have to really be concerned about here. You, you have to watch the patient while it's being done. I usually have one of my nurses watch the patient. But other than that, no real workup necessary and really no, no big risk involved. Uh, age, age limitations, nothing, let's say. Not that really. Again, you know, the, the older we are, the more inflammation we have. So that's the real thing. I mean, there's really not too many contraindications for this procedure. And we see good results with it. And, and again, anecdotally, I can say it really can help with COVID. It can help, especially with post-COVID. You know, we're seeing people with lingering symptoms. This pretty much makes them go away. Okay, you mentioned also about the matrix metalloproteases. Uh, are right. you saying the uh, MMPs uh, are are good are good for patients uh, as they stimulate stem cells, well, or is it different? MMPs are good and bad. Okay, you know okay. the MMP is good and bad. Some of them you need some of them, but this particular MMP, it's MMP nine, is one that kind of binds the stem cells in the marrow. It's like I say, it puts the marrow in jail or the, the stem cells in jail in the marrow. And it basically is, you know, proteolized and basically releases the stem cells. But MMPs can really affect the joint. Uh, there's a whole host of things. A2M is sort of in that category a bit. I see. And I know you're a big A2M fan, so. <laughs> Dr. Joe, uh, there, here's another question from Pash. Pash, go ahead. Dr. Joe, thank you so much for your lecture again, as usual. Well, it's my pleasure. My pleasure. Lucky for you to always lecture and find time for, the, for us here. So, okay. Dr. Joe, my question is, actually, how long does the, does the procedure last usually? And the other question is, you mentioned that some patients feel tired after. Is it, is it a usual thing that they feel just like in dialysis, post-dialysis? Thank you, Dr. Joe. Okay, again, now, you know, we, it's not like a post-dialysis in a, in, a, in a kidney failure patient. This is basically, some of our patients feel dramatic. They have boundless energy. Other people say, well, I feel a little better, but they kind of notice after, you know, a few days, of saying, you know, I'm feeling better and it's really helping. How long it lasts, it depends on the patient. It depends on the condition that they, they have. But it, 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 you know, the effects can last for quite some time. Uh, I found pretty much if you have a very healthy patient, they don't seem to have as much of an epiphany as the patient who is more ill, so to speak. Dr. Joe, I'd like to um, uh, clarify my question. My question is for a procedure, for one procedure, how long does it usually last, the procedure in the clinic when we do it? Is it an hour, 30 minutes? Oh, okay. The procedure, the, the, the hardest part of the procedure is starting the two IVs. Once the two IVs are started, then it's about 45 to 50 minutes. I see. Okay. So it's... it's Thank you, Dr. Joe. It's really quite... My pleasure. You, you should be able to watch, uh, watch TV while we're doing it. <laughs> okay. Uh, Dr. Joe, how is this different? Because uh, we're doing NAD here. Uh, if... if, if and AD is being done, should we do it simultaneously with EBO2? I, I would do it afterwards. Now, let me ask you, you're doing NAD intravenously? Yes, intravenously, yes. All right, I'm going to give everybody a secret now. 
And if you reveal my secret, I'm going to come to the Philippines and shoot you. Okay. <laughs> now here's the secret. I want you, I want you to do the following. How long does it, Jim, how long does it typically take you to do an NAD IV treatment? Uh, usually uh, 30 minutes. For NAD intravenously? How much are you giving? Uh, maybe because the preparation is, uh, there's a vial that there's a compounding, compounding pharmacy here that we ask them to uh, d prepare the NAD. And then uh, right. when it comes to us, it's, it's already ready for injection. So no, but now you're, you're injecting or are you giving it intravenously? Yeah, intravenously, yes, intravenously. I mean, typically most people need, it, need an hour or two or more. When you're giving it like 250 milligrams, a lot of people will need, you know, two hours. Usually uh, the one that they prepare is uh, because we were given the instruction in the, in the pharmacy was like 30 minutes at least to an hour. It's, it's not that much in terms of the, of the concentration. You, you may not have a high concentration. Okay. Yeah, I, I will try to check the exact concentration of that. All right, here's what I want you all to do now. This is, a, this is something I learned and it's an amazing thing. I want you to use something, at least in the United States, it's over the counter. It's called TMG, trimethylglycine. Okay. It's a pill. And if you give the patient trimethylglycine, and you can go read some of my blogs about this, but if you give them trimethylglycine, you can, you can cut the time it takes to give them the NAD in half. Okay. Very simple thing. I, give them, I usually tell them, take it. Uh, I'd like them to take it usually the, the morning of or the night before. And because it can take a long time to give patients high doses of NAD. NAD is extremely important. You, you, you know, that's something that you're, it's a win for everybody. The doctor can make some money on it, but it's also very good for the patient to take. But TMG, trimethylglycine, okay. very important to take because it'll speed the time up that they can, they can do it in half the time they normally would. So which one should come first, the NAD or the EV, ABO2? Usually I do the EBO2, but it's interesting. Tomorrow I have a lady that has to have a conference first. So I said, all right, we'll do NAD first, EBO2 second. It doesn't really matter because remember, EBO2 is going to make NAD anyway. Now, I would probably not do like vitamin C or something first because I'm not sure what can happen with the ozone in there. So I usually do vitamin C, things like that after the EBO2. I see. I see. So uh, how often should you do this in a year, like EBO2? How sh often should they do this? You know, for a healthy patient, maybe once every six months or so, or, you know, maybe even a little longer. And again, if you have somebody who's an autoimmune disease or something like that, well, then I would probably maybe do it more often, depending on what we're trying to treat. I see. Like, uh, the, uh, well, of course, uh, a lot, we're, we're seeing a lot of uh, arthritic patients, Dr. Joe, and pain patients. Okay. So, so what are the, what's the problem that most of those patients have? If they're arthritic, yeah, what's, what's... Usually they complain of knee pain, back pain, usually. Right? Knee and hip, hip pain. Okay. I mean, this will help them some, but I still would prefer, you know, regular stem cells to the joints. Sometimes I'm very, uh, very fond of doing uh, V cells, very small embryonic like stem cells, which come from the patient. Um and things like that. But this will help reduce inflammation because again, it's stimulating NRF2. Okay. So thank you very much, Dr. Joe. Uh, again, my pleasure. You guys have a good day and uh, I look forward to talking to you guys again and maybe visiting you one of these days when all this goes away and we have our world back again. Yeah, we're gonna pay you a visit, Dr. Joe, in Florida when all this is over. I look forward to it. Yeah, I, 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 I'm looking forward to uh, seeing the active patients being infused with EBO2. <laughs> Is, uh, are these... Uh, well, we'll teach you how to do it. Yeah. Are these... Uh, uh, what's this? All the equipments needed are available? We can, we can always... Uh, yeah, we have, you know, actually, you can talk to Bob. I mean, Bob can actually give you the actual economics of it. I think Bob said if you purchase a kit after about seven or eight patients, everything is paid for, and then it's just, you're making profit after that. I so see. we're actually we're actually helping to sell this. So talk to Bob, he can give you the details and, 
and you know maybe you can get one or two units in the Philippines, and that that would be something pretty interesting, I think. I see. So thank you, Dr. Joe, again, and uh, very nice to hear you again. It's been my pleasure. Well. Sorry, we had a little mix up in the beginning, but we got it all squared away. Yeah. You're not getting any older, Dr. Joe. You always look young. <laughs> trying not to. I'm taking my cells and my EBO2 and working out every day. All right, listen, you guys all have a good day, and it's my pleasure talking to you. Bye now. Take care. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Joe, and uh, bye, and see you soon. Thank you very, very much. Very good. Thank Give you. my regards to everyone. Say hello to Attorney Vic for me. Give him my regards. Yes, I'll, I'll, I'll do that. I'll, I'll tell right. him that. Take care, everybody. Okay, right. Bye now. Thank you. Take care. God bless. Thank you. Take care.